Welcome everybody. This is the podcast for chapter 18 covering the reproductive system. So we're going to talk about how it is we generate new human beings. We'll start with the male reproductive system, describing the components of the testes, summarizing the events of meiosis in the production of sperm, and naming the functional anatomy of a mature spermatozoan. We'll explain the roles of regulatory hormones and testosterone in establishing and maintaining male sexual function. We'll explain the roles played by the male reproductive tract and accessory glands in the functional maturation, nourishment, and storage and transport of sperm. We'll describe the structures and functions of the penis. And we'll describe benign prostatic hypertrophy, prostate cancer, and testicular cancer. We'll then move to the female reproductive system where we'll describe the anatomy of the ovaries, the uterus, and associated structures. We'll outline the steps of oogenesis in the ovaries and summarize the events of the ovarian cycle. We'll describe the structure, histology, and function of the uterine tubes and the uterus. We'll describe the anatomy and function of the vagina and the external genitalia and discuss the structure and function of the mammary glands. We'll summarize the hormonal regulation of the female ovarian and uterine cycles as well. So, both sexes have a reproductive system. There is a male and a female version of the reproductive system. The gonads are the reproductive organs. They produce gametes and hormones. Accessory glands and organs secrete fluids into ducts of the reproductive system and the external genitalia provide the means of allowing the gametes to eventually meet and that's what affects the process of fertilization followed by implantation and development from first a, a blastocyst then an embryo and a fetus and then a neonate so remember that in males the gonads are the testes and in females the gonads are the ovaries. So the male gonads produce sperm and as an endocrine function they produce testosterone and to a lesser extent estrogen and progesterone. While in the female the gonads are the ovaries, they produce eggs, that's their exocrine function, and they produce estrogen and progesterone and to a lesser extent testosterone as their endocrine function. So the male reproductive system is relatively straightforward. The gonad is the testis. They produce the male gametes which are the sperm. The accessory glands include the seminal glands, the prostate gland, and the bulbourethral gland. They secrete sperm, um, media known as semen. The purpose of the semen is to provide fuel for the sperm to make the journey from the tip of the penis ultimately to the egg and also to produce a favorable pH so that the sperm can survive the acidic conditions of the female reproductive tract and successfully make it all the way to the egg. The male reproductive tract consists of the seminal uh, or the uh, epididymis, the vas deferens, and the urethra, and we should also include the seminiferous tubules uh, in that block of structures. So let's pencil that in real quick. The seminiferous tubules. And so we can track uh, the journey of a sperm cell through the male reproductive tract. We start in the seminiferous tubules. The seminiferous tubules lead to the epididymis. Which lead to the vas deferens. which lead to the ejaculatory duct
which leads to the urethra, and that allows them to exit the body. Now along the way, they pick up the seminal secretions, which are made, again, by the seminal glands, the prostate gland, the bulbo-urethral gland, and of course we can't forget the testes, which is where the sperm are actually produced. The external genitalia include the scrotum and the penis. Okay, looking at the male reproductive tract, we can trace the path of sperm from the seminiferous tubules to the epididymis, to the vas deferens, to the ejaculatory duct, and then to the urethra. The accessory organs secrete fluids into the ejaculatory ducts and urethra in order to create an environment that allows the sperm to swim by providing fuel and providing the proper pH for them to make their long journey from the tip of the penis to the egg. The external genitalia consists of the scrotum, which encloses the testes, and the penis, which contains erectile tissue through which the urethra passes, as well as additional erectile tissue on the dorsal side of the penis, erection, of course, being critical for sexual intercourse. Scrotal structures include the dartos muscle, which is the smooth muscle in the skin of the scrotum, whose contraction makes the scrotal skin wrinkle, and the cremaster muscle, which contracts to move the testes closer to the body. And the reason for this is to maintain a temperature in the testes approximately three degrees below that of body temperature, which is optimum for sperm production. Serous membranes line the scrotal cavity, and a tough fibrous capsule covers the testis, which is continuous with septa that subdivide the interior of the testis into separate lobules. The lobules contain the seminiferous tubules, which is where the sperm are actually produced. And it's very important to understand when we look inside the testes that a man is fertile from puberty until death. The cell division known as meiosis, is what generates the gametes, which have half the amount of genetic material as a body cell, and this process continues until death and begins at puberty for the man. Now, this is different than in the female. We're going to find out, when we look at the female reproductive system, that a woman is born with all the eggs she's ever going to have, and from puberty until death, what happens is that those eggs are ovulated, and if they're fertilized, they have the potential to implant, and there's the possibility then for a baby to be generated as a result. But most of the eggs will end up degenerating or aging in the ovary. Monthly, what will happen is that about two dozen follicles will be tapped for maturation beginning each month from the time a woman reaches puberty until she's dead. Of those two dozen follicles, each containing an egg, only one normally will ovulate, and the rest of the follicles will die, and the eggs inside them will die. The remaining eggs, waiting for the next monthly cycle, will then age. As a result, the older a woman is, the older her gametes become. She'll eventually reach a point where the, the last remaining follicle will ovulate the last egg, and at that point, reproduction is no longer possible, and that's a condition known as menopause. The testes are the shape of a flattened egg. They're about five centimeters long, three centimeters wide, and two and a half centimeters thick. Sperm produced in the seminiferous tubules are generated from puberty until death in the male. Each seminiferous tubule is about 80 centimeters long, the total length of all the tubules laid end to end is about half a mile. The sperm are then moved to the reet testis, which is a maze of passageways that are connected to the efferent ductules that merge to form the epididymis. And in the epididymis, what will happen is that the sperm will become capable of using their flagella. Basically, they will become motile, capable of swimming from the tip of the penis to the egg. Spermatogenesis 
occurs inside the testes. The spermatogonia are the stem cells in the seminiferous tubules that produce the male gamete. They are diploid and they contain 23 pairs of chromosomes. Through the process of spermatogenesis, they produce the spermatozoa. A normal adult male produces over 100 to 200 million sperm daily. And you can see here the process of sperm generation. We begin with spermatogenesis, which is a four-week process. The mitosis of the spermatogonium produces two daughter cells. One spermatogonium stays in contact with the basement membrane and the other becomes a primary spermatocyte, which then engages in meiosis I. The primary spermatocyte divides into two secondary spermatocytes, each with only 23 chromosomes. Meiosis II causes each secondary spermatocyte to divide into two haploid spermatids so that we get a total of four spermatids per primary spermatocyte. What follows is spermiogenesis, which is the physical maturation of the sperm. The spermatid matures in a t into a spermatozoan um, by losing a lot of its cytoplasmic components and forming the unique sperm structures we'll see in the next slide consisting of the head which contains the genetic material and a structure called the acrosome, the midpiece which contains mitochondria and the engine to move the flagella or the tail. Okay? So this is going on constantly inside the seminiferous tubules and what we have to appreciate is that the minute that these primary spermatocytes are engaging in meiosis one they have exchanged genetic material in prophase of meiosis one and the result is that we have a unique arrangement of DNA on these chromosomes which means that these cells now are genetically distinct from the male that produces them which means potentially they could be destroyed by the immune system however because of the presence of a structure called the blood testis barrier let's write that down, the blood testis barrier which is a series of tight junctions in between where the spermatogonia are and where the primary spermatocytes are located in the seminiferous tubules of the testes, it's possible for the sperm to be protected from the immune system so that they're not destroyed. This is different from what we'll see in the female reproductive system where for every oogonium that engages in oogenesis we only produce one egg. This is a look at the spermatozoan structure it's specialized to deliver chromosomes to the female gamete. It lacks most organelles and intracellular structures to reduce weight. The acrosome contains enzymes needed for fertilization, while the head contains a nucleus with chromosomes. The acrosomal head contains digestive enzymes that are able to essentially degrade the protective layer around the egg called the corona radiata, the result being that um, the combined action of many sets of acrosomal enzymes from many sperm that attach to the egg is sufficient to allow one lucky sperm to fuse with the egg cell membrane, the result of course being fertilization. The neck contains centrioles while the midpiece contains mitochondria that produce ATP for the engine that moves the tail. And this is what allows the sperm to swim from the tip of the penis to the egg. Sperm are the only human cell with flagella, and as a result, they are motile. Testosterone is produced primarily by interstitial cells in the testes. These cells lie outside the seminiferous tubules, between them, basically. Within the seminiferous tubules, spermatogenesis and spermiogenesis occur in the cytoplasm of nurse cells, 
which also play a role in hormonal regulation which controls spermatogenesis. Essentially, these cells, which are called sustentacular cells, are able to protect and nourish the sperm so that they can complete gametogenesis and become functional gametes. They also produce a, um, a protein that allows testosterone to become concentrated in and around where gametogenesis occurs. This is called androgen binding protein and thus they facilitate um, the action of testosterone which is produced by the interstitial cells also known as the cells of Leydig, L-E-Y-D-I-G. What you're looking at here is the hormonal regulation that's responsible for controlling the rate of spermatogenesis. Gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus stimulates the release of luteinizing and follicle stimulating hormone from the anterior pituitary. The luteinizing hormone targets the interstitial cells of the testes, increasing the secretion of testosterone, while follicle stimulating hormone targets the nurse cells of the seminiferous tubules. This promotes spermatogenesis and increases the secretion of inhibin, which inhibits follicle stimulating hormone. So that's one of the other products of the nurse cells is this inhibit. Okay, so let's write down essentially what does what. Okay, so we can see here in the hypothalamus that we have production of GnRH, right? GnRH is going to spur production of luteinizing and follicle stimulating hormone. The luteinizing hormone will target the interstitial cells. Those are the cells that are between the seminiferous tubules. These are also called Leydig cells. Okay. While follicle stimulating hormone will target the nurse cells, which are also called sustentacular cells. Sometimes also called Sertoli cells. The result will be that the interstitial cells will increase production of testosterone and testosterone promotes a wide variety of processes. It helps to maintain the accessory glands and organs of the male reproductive system. It establishes and maintains the male secondary sex characteristics, which include many things. Um, this includes an increase in bone density, an increase in muscle mass, an increase in hematocrit, we'll just call it crit here, an increase in basal metabolic rate, and also controls the sex drive or libido. Okay, This is one of the reasons why testosterone is prized as a performance enhancing drug by athletes. What else does testosterone do? Well, um, it also has a feedback effect where eventually as the levels build up in the blood it will feed back to the hypothalamus and this will cut off production of, so this is negative feedback, of gonadotropin releasing hormone. Okay until such time as the testosterone levels fall again and GnRH can be produced and then the whole cycle starts over again. We should also note that at the same time these Sertoli cells are being stimulated and they will begin to facilitate spermatogenesis and spermiogenesis while producing inhibin which has a negative feedback effect on the anterior pituitary cutting down on the production of the gonadotropins, okay. particularly FSH. Capacitation 
is the process of causing the sperm to be capable of fertilizing an egg. The testes produce sperm that can be stored in the vas deferens for several months. Other parts of the male reproductive system responsible for functional maturation, nourishment, storage, and support also participate. The sperm have to go through the process of capacitation in order to be capable of fertilizing the egg. The sperm become more motile when mixed with the secretions of the seminal glands. The sperm become capable of fertilization when exposed to conditions in the female reproductive tract. Essentially, as they swim through the tract, the acrosome becomes more fragile so that by the time they reach the corona radiata that surrounds the, the female's egg, it's easy to rupture and release those proteolytic enzymes which will eventually allow one lucky sperm cell to make it to the egg cell membrane. Seminal glands contribute 60 percent of the semen. You can see the seminal glands here and here. Um, we're looking here at an, a posterior view of the of the male uh, urogenital system, this being the bladder, this being where the vas deferens merge becoming the ejaculatory duct down here and entering the prostatic urethra. Okay, so the seminal vesicles are anterior to the point where the vas deferens fuse with the ejaculatory duct. The prostate gland also is very important, as are the bulbourethrals. The ejaculatory duct carries fluid from the seminal gland and the ampulla to the urethra. The prostate gland encircles the urethra as it leaves the bladder, producing 30% of the semen, while the bulbourethral glands at the base of the penis have ducts that empty into the urethra that secrete a thick alkaline mucus that lubricates the tip of the penis and neutralizes the urinary acids in the urethra again so that we don't affect sperm motility. So in summary, right, the glands that contribute to semen include the seminal vesicle, prostate gland, the bulbourethral gland, and we can't forget the testes. Okay. Incidentally, the bulbourethral gland gets its name because of its location. It is located near the bulb of the penis and the urethra. You can see its location next to the urethra. The bulb of the penis is simply that portion of erectile tissue that's closest to the body. The penis is a tubular organ. It contains the urethra. It conducts urine to the exterior and introduces semen into the female's vagina. The root is the fixed portion that attaches the penis to the body wall just underneath the pubic symphysis. The body, or shaft, is the tubular movable portion of the penis, while the neck is the narrow portion between the shaft and the glands, which is the expanded distal end that surrounds the external urethral orifice. The prepuce, or foreskin, is the fold of skin that normally covers the glands, but is usually removed in a surgical procedure known as circumcision. The purpose of circumcision is hygienic. It's to prevent bacteria from growing in the crevice between the glands and the prepuce. The erectile tissue in the penis facilitates, obviously, erection of the gland. The columns of vascular erectile tissue are networks of vascular spaces. At rest, they supply arteries constricted and muscle partitions between the space tense. In response to sexual stimulation, the vessels dilate, increasing blood flow, engorging the vascular spaces and causing an erection. So bottom line, during an erection, blood flows into the penis more rapidly than it flows out. The result is a hydrostatic function, 
which is erection of the organ. The skin of the penis resembles the thin skin of the scrotum. The dermis has a layer of smooth muscle continuous with the dartos muscle of the scrotum, while areolar tissue allows the skin to move without distorting deeper structures. Elastic fibers found deep to the areolar tissue provide partitions uh, within the erectile tissue. The two corpora cavernosa are found on the anterior surface while a single corpus spongiosum surrounds the penile urethra and expands to form the glands. So you can see those here in cross-section, corpora cavernosa here and here, corpora spongiosum, there's the urethra. Okay. So bottom line, okay, when a man gets an erection, we have a, a an effect that comes from primarily the, um, the parasympathetic stimulation of these blood vessels, causing them to dilate, and that's what opens up the blood vessels in the erectile tissue, causing them to engorge with blood and the organ to become erect. And this process is, is prolonged by medications such as Viagra, which essentially increase the amount of time that cyclic AMP hangs around inside the target tissue which is the smooth muscle that promotes the vasodilation and that allows the erection to last longer than it normally would. Occasionally the prostate gland can malfunction. Benign prostatic hypertrophy or BPH occurs spontaneously in men typically over the age of 50. Declining testosterone production in the presence of estrogen may stimulate the growth of the prostate. Severe cases can constrict the urethra. And the problem here, of course, is if the urine builds up in the bladder, it can back up into the ureters and into the kidney, and that can damage the organ. Prostate cancer is the second most common cancer and the second most common cause of cancer deaths in males and can be screened for by a blood test for prostate-specific antigen, also known as PSA. The treatment involves radiation therapy or surgical removal, which we call prostatectomy. In some cases, we can core out the region of the urethra that's occluded by the enlarged prostate. Normally, a uh, diagnosis is performed by palpating the prostate through the rectum and anus in the event that we feel unusually large gland or we detect bulges or bumps on it, then we can recommend um, a PSA test and, if necessary, a biopsy. Testicular cancer is common in males between the age of 15 and 35. The relatively low rate occurs if we include all ages, which results in three cases per 100,000 males. More than 95% of testicular cancers come from abnormal spermatogonia or spermatocytes. The treatment is a combination of chemotherapy and orchiectomy, which is removal of the testes. The survival rate is 95% as a result of early diagnosis and treatment. And again, this is true for any cancer. The earlier the detection, the better the likelihood that radiation, chemotherapy, and immunotherapy are going to be affected because the numbers of cancer cells are still low at that point and the likelihood that the treatment will hit all the targeted tissue is very, very high. Now we switch gears to the female reproductive system, which produces sex hormones and functional gametes, but also has to protect and support the developing embryo, fetus, and newborn. The main organs include the ovaries, the uterine tubes, the uterus and vagina, and the external genitalia, with the accessory organs including the mammary glands and smaller accessory glands. The gonads in the female are the ovaries, which produce oocytes that mature into ova. The female reproductive tract includes the uterine tubes, which lead into the uterus, which is the site of embryonic and fetal development and the vagina, which is the site of sperm deposition. It's also the birth canal and the passageway for menstrual fluid. The external genitalia include the clitoris, which contains erectile tissue, 
and the labia that contain glands that lubricate the vaginal entrance. The paired ovaries are almond-shaped organs near the lateral wall of the pelvic cavity that produce oocytes and secrete estrogen and progesterone as well as inhibin, which inhibits follicle-stimulating hormone production from the anterior pituitary. The uterine tube contains an expanded funnel known as the infundibulum that opens into the pelvic cavity along the surface of the ovary. The other end opens into the uterus. The uterus is inferior to the ovary. It also lies above the urinary bladder. It's usually angled forward over the top of the bladder. The rectouterine pouch is the space between the sigmoid colon and the uterus, while the vesicouterine pouch is the space between the uterus and the urinary bladder. The vagina extends from the uterus to the external genitalia. Accessory glands lubricate the vaginal entrance and external genitalia, which include the clitoris and the labia. And so you can see here the sagittal view of the female abdominal pelvic region. There you can see the pubic symphysis. You can see the bladder, the urethra, the uterus, the vagina, the ovary, and the oviduct. Here is the cervix, and there is the vagina, and then, of course, the rectum and the anus. Other accessory glands include the greater and lesser vestibular glands. And you can also see the clitoris and the labia down here. The ovary and the uterus are held in place by a series of connective tissue attachments to the surrounding body walls. These ligaments include the ovarian ligament which runs from the medial ovary to the uterus, the mesovarium which are folds of mesentery that support and stabilize each ovary. The suspensory ligaments that extend from the lateral surface of the ovary to the pelvic wall. The broad ligament which is an extensive mesentery that's attached to the sides and floor of the pelvic cavity. And you can see each of these ligaments outlined here. Okay, So broad ligament, ovarian ligament, up here suspensory ligament and you can also if you look here see the uterosacral ligament which runs from the uterus to the sacrum. As a result of this geometry okay, and the arrangement of these structures we note that it is only connective tissue that holds this organ in place. As a result a significant blow to the abdominal pelvic region could dislodge the uterus and abrogate its function. As women age, sometimes these connections to the body wall become weakened at the same time as the smooth muscle that is in the middle layer of the uterus, known as the myometrium, loses muscle tone and the uterus can prolapse outside the body. This can be surgically corrected. Typical ovary dimensions are 5 centimeters long, 2.5 centimeters wide, 8 millimeters thick and weigh between 6 to 8 grams so they're comparable in size to the testes. The ovarian hilum is where the blood vessels enter and leave the ovary. It's also where the ovary attaches to the mesovarium. The interior of the ovary is divided into the superficial cortex where the gametes are produced and the deeper medulla which is primarily connective tissue. Now, notice the arrangement here. You're looking at where the uterine tube and the ovary are located inside the abdominal pelvic cavity. Notice that they are not connected to each other. There is space between them. And this means that when the ovary releases its egg, it has to be sucked up into the uterine tube in time for it not to fall inside the abdominal pelvic cavity. And 99 times out of 100, that's exactly what happens. In the event that the egg does not make it into the uterine tube, it can fall into the abdominal pelvic cavity, and if that egg becomes fertilized, it can implant, and that's an example of what we call an ectopic pregnancy. So you can see here the hilum, okay, the mesovarium, the broad ligament down here, and then of course the cross section here 
through the fallopian tube. This is cortex and this of course is medulla. Oogenesis is similar in many ways to spermatogenesis with a few differences. Mitosis of the ogonium produced two daughter cells which is a process that completes prior to birth. Once the oogonium uh, are essentially populated inside the ovary what will happen is that we'll generate an oogonium and one primary oocyte. The primary oocyte will then engage in meiosis one between the third and seven months of fetal development. They halt the process at prophase one until puberty when rising levels of follicle stimulating hormone trigger a few primary oocytes to continue meiosis one. The primary oocyte then divides into a secondary oocyte and the first polar body each having only 23 chromosomes so these are now haploid cells. The secondary oocyte gets the majority of the cytoplasm while the polar body degrades. Next is meiosis 2. The secondary oocyte begins meiosis 2. The first polar body may or may not complete meiosis 2. Generally it does not. It becomes suspended in metaphase II when ovulated. If fertilization does not occur, meiosis II does not complete. If fertilization does not occur, the secondary oocyte divides into the second polar body and an ovum, which are both haploid. The ovum then unites with the sperm and the polar bodies degenerate. The ovarian cycle involves changes in the ovarian follicles, which are specialized structures inside the ovary that protect the developing oocytes. There's about two million primordial follicles at the birth of the female, each having a primary oocyte. By puberty, 400,000 primordial follicles are left. So you have approximately a 60% die-off between the birth of the female and by the time puberty rolls around. These 60 percent degenerate in a process known as atresia. Each month follicle stimulating hormone stimulates the development of several follicles. In the follicular stage we see the formation of the primary follicle. The follicle cells enlarge, divide, and form several layers around the primary oocyte. A clear region around the oocyte, known as the zona pellucida, forms, and the follicular cells produce estrogen, and to a lesser extent progesterone. A secondary follicle forms when the wall of the follicle thickens and deeper cells secrete a fluid. These fluid-filled pockets expand and separate the inner and outer follicular layers. In the follicular stage from tertiary follicle to ovulation, the tertiary follicle, or all sometimes as it is known, the mature graphene follicle, forms between days 10 and 14. The corona radiata is the protective layer of cells around the now secondary oocyte. The expanded central chamber is the antrum, which is filled with follicular fluid. Ovulation, which comes near the end of the follicular phase, and marks the beginning of the luteal phase is the process whereby the tertiary follicle releases the secondary oocyte and corona radiata into the pelvic cavity at which point it normally goes into the oviduct. The follicular stage then leads to the secretory stage the corpus luteum which has been formed from the remaining follicular cells in the ovary secretes progesterone and to a lesser extent estrogen. The progesterone stimulates the maturation of the uterine lining. The corpus luteum then degenerates if no fertilization occurs by 12 days producing a knot of scar tissue known as the corpus albicans. The progesterone and estrogen levels then drop dramatically and this marks the end of the ovarian cycle until of course the next month rolls around and we tap another two dozen follicles for the same process. Okay.
The uterine tubes are hollow muscular structures about 13 centimeters long. The infundibulum is the expanded portion adjacent to the ovary and the fimbriae are finger-like projections on the lateral side of the oviduct that are very close to but do not touch the ovary. The cilia line the inner infundibulum beating towards the uterine tube. The oocytes are transported by ciliary movement and by peristaltic contraction of the oviduct. The ampulla is the middle segment of the tube while the isthmus is the narrow portion that's connected to the uterine wall. There's three layers of the uterine wall. The parametrium, which is the outer surface, is continuous with the peritoneum. The myometrium is the thick muscular middle layer. Smooth muscle here provides most of the force to move the fetus out of the uterus and into the vagina. And the endometrium is the inner lining, which is made up of glandular tissue that demonstrates characteristic changes with each uterine cycle. And this is really what nourishes the embryo and the fetus first as a result of glandular secretions and then ultimately it serves as the site of exchange of nutrients and waste products as well as oxygen and carbon dioxide via the placenta which will be attached to the endometrium and provide the baby the ability essentially to survive off of nutrients in the mother's blood supply. The lumen of the uterus contains two parts, the uterine cavity, which is the large superior chamber, which is continuous with the isthmus of the uterine tubes, and the cervical canal, which is a constricted passageway from the inferior end of the uterine cavity on into the vagina. The three anatomical regions of the uterus include the fundus, which is the domed upper region, the body, which is the largest portion, in a non-pregnant uterus, the body is two-thirds of the mass of the uterus. And finally, the cervix, which is the inferior portion surrounding the cervical canal. And then projects into the vagina. So you can see here the three portions, the fundus, the body, the cervix. The uterus is capable of tremendous change in size and shape with pregnancy. It provides mechanical protection, nutritional support, and waste removal for the embryo from weeks 1 through 8, for the fetus from weeks 9 through delivery. Contraction of the muscular wall is important for delivering the fetus. Fertilization is defined as the penetration of a secondary oocyte by a sperm cell. The uterine tube is the usual location for fertilization. The secondary oocyte is viable for between 12 and 24 hours after ovulation and then starts to degenerate. It takes three to four days for the secondary oocyte to reach the uterine cavity. The vagina is the elastic, highly distensible muscular tube that serves as the organ of copulation and the birth canal and the exit for menstrual fluid. It extends from the cervix to the vestibule, which is the space bounded by the external genitalia. It's typically 9 centimeters long with a variable diameter. The internal passageway is the vaginal canal, which also serves as a passageway for menstrual fluid, receives the penis during intercourse, and holds sperm prior to passage into the uterus. It also forms the inferior portion of the birth canal. The fornix is the shallow recess in the vagina surrounding the tip of the cervix. The rugae are the folds formed by the vaginal lining when it's relaxed and they allow expansion of the vagina during intercourse and during childbirth. The lining is non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium and of course the reason for this is that stratified squamous epithelium is more mechanically sound than simple squamous epithelium. The hymen is an elastic epithelial fold partially blocking the entrance to the vagina it can become stretched or torn during sexual intercourse or during tampon use or as a result of a variety of different processes. The vulva or pudendum is the area containing the female external genitalia. The vestibule being the central space bounded by the labia minora which are medial to the vagina and the labia majora which are lateral to it.
The lesser vestibular glands keep the vestibule moist, while the greater vestibular glands are activated during sexual arousal. The greater vestibular glands have the same tissue origin as the bulbourethral gland in the male. The labia minora is analogous to the underside of the penis in the male. The clitoris is analogous to the male penis, and the labia majora are analogous to the scrotum of the male. The mons pubis is a bulge of adipose tissue deep to the skin and superficial to the pubic symphysis. The clitoris projects into the vestibule and contains erectile tissue comparable to the tissue in the penis. The prepuce is formed by extensions of the labia minora that encircle the clitoris. The labia majora are large folds of skin that encircle the minora and the adjacent structures. They are normally populated by pubic hair. The mammary glands are the breast tissue. They provide nourishment for the developing infant. Lactation is controlled by the hormones prolactin and milk released by the hormone oxytocin. It lies directly over the pectoralis major muscle and is embedded in subcutaneous tissue of the pectoral fat pad deep to the skin. It's supported by bands of connective tissue called suspensory ligaments of the breast. The glands, is, glands are divided into lobes. Each lobe has several secretory lobules. Each lobule is, control, is composed of secretory alveoli. Ducts from the lobules converge into one lactiferous duct per lobe, which expand near the nipple to form the lactiferous sinus. The nipple is the conical projection where 15 to 20 lactiferous sinuses open to the surface. The reddish-brown skin around the nipple is known as the areolar, and the grainy texture from the sebaceous glands deep to the surface give it its characteristic color and texture. So you can see here that really the majority of breast tissue is adipose tissue and it's only during uh, milk production that we see the, um, the lactiferous glands increase in volume and the breast enlargement take place. It's also very important to note that breast milk is essentially healthier for the baby than formula due to its antibody content. This allows the infant's immune system to become functional while the antibodies in the breast milk protect it against pathogens and so by the time the infant is no longer nursing it has a functioning immune system and it's ready to withstand pathogenic attack whereas formula does not contain antibodies. Now, so this is one of the primary examples that's always given of passive natural immunity. Okay, the ovarian and uterine cycles are controlled as a result of changes in hormone levels that occur in um, monthly periods. Two cycles have to be in sync for proper reproductive function to take place. Monthly hormone fluctuations cause physiological changes that can affect body temperature. During the luteal phase, we see high progesterone production. And during the follicular phase, high estrogen production causes the basal body temperature to be about three-tenths of a degree centigrade lower than the luteal phase. The uterine cycle consists of the menstrual uh, cycle, which is sometimes termed the, uter termed the uterine cycle. It begins at puberty. The first menstrual period is called menarche, and the last one, of course, is called menopause. Menarche usually uh, has an age of onset between 11 and 12 years of age. It averages 28 days with a range from between 21 to 35. The cycle continues until menopause at the age of 45 to 55. The regular cycle may be interrupted by illness, stress, starvation, or by pregnancy. And so what you're looking at here are some of the different characteristics of this monthly cycle. Here we're looking at the level of gonadotropins during the cycle and during the follicular phase FSH and LH levels are relatively low okay um, and then what will happen is at mid-cycle you will see a spike of LH and FSH and that promotes ovulation 
along with the mechanical action of the fimbriae on the surface of the ovary, the mature follicle will erupt and the egg will be released into the oviduct. After that point, you begin to see LH and FSH levels fall. Over here, you're looking at the changes in the follicle during the cycle. We begin with the primordial follicle becoming a primary follicle, then a secondary, then a tertiary or mature follicle, which it will then ovulate. The remaining follicular cells will form the corpus luteum, which will eventually degenerate, forming the corpus albicans towards the end of the cycle. This is provided there is no uh, fertilization and implantation. Ovarian hormone levels are shown here. You can see how estrogen levels are initially quite high with progesterone levels remaining relatively low for the first half of the cycle and then when we have the formation of the corpus luteum we see an initial drop in estrogen levels and a big spike in progesterone levels and this is designed to to prepare the endometrium, which you can see down here, for the arrival of the potentially fertilized egg. You can see levels of inhibin uh, spiking as well at mid-cycle, then dropping and then beginning to rise again during the luteal phase of the cycle. The bottom line is that these um, relatively uh, high levels of progesterone and to some extent estrogen um, prevent the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone throughout the entire cycle um, spe specifically in the secretory or luteal phase of the cycle and that's so that we don't induce ovulation by a subsequent follicle while we have a potentially fertilized egg implanting in the uterus so as long as these levels stay high, GnRH levels stay low, and LH and FSH levels stay low, as you can see here. Okay. This is a chart showing you the changes of the endometrium that occur. We have the destruction of the uterine lining from the previous menstrual period, finishing about midway through the follicular phase, and then during the rest of the follicular phase we see mitosis responsible for thickening the endometrial lining once the luteal phase begins the increase in the thickness of the lining is due primarily to hypertrophy of the endometrium due to the expansion of glandular tissue that we find there and then down here of course we see the change in body temperature that takes place so stay tuned for some um, videos that will talk a little bit about spermatogenesis, oogenesis, and the uterine cycle. And I will join everybody in our final podcast. Thank you for listening. Let's compare spermatogenesis with oogenesis. Both processes start before birth when embryonic germ cells differentiate into spermatogonia in the testis of a male or oogonia in the ovary of a female. Both types of cells are diploid. However, whereas mitotic divisions continue to generate new spermatogonia in the male until death, in the female, the generation of more oogonia by mitosis halts well before birth. Although spermatogonia develop into primary spermatocytes throughout life in the male, in the female, some oogonia develop into primary oocytes, but only before birth. Males can continue to produce viable sperm from puberty until death but females can produce viable eggs only from puberty until the supply of primary oocytes is depleted. Meiosis I does not begin until puberty in the testis of the male. Meiosis I begins before birth and ends at puberty in the ovary of the female. Meiosis II occurs within the testis at any time from puberty until death in the male. Meiosis II begins within the ovary only at ovulation in the female and ends within the oviduct upon fertilization by a sperm cell. The final result of spermatogenesis is four haploid sperm cells for each spermatogonium. In contrast, oogenesis can result in one egg cell and two polar bodies for each oogonium, but only if fertilization has occurred.
To understand the various ways that medical science can assist reproduction, it is important to understand how the reproductive system functions in both sexes, because the cause of infertility often lies equally with both men and women. The main players in the female reproductive cycle are the pituitary gland, the ovaries, and the uterus. Their activities are closely coordinated. Each month, one or other ovary releases a single egg, an event known as ovulation. It is brought about by a series of complex interactions between the pituitary gland, the ovaries, and the uterus. The pituitary gland is itself under the control of this small area of the brain known as the hypothalamus. A new menstrual cycle begins when the nerve cells of this center secrete a hormone called gonadotrophin-releasing hormone, GnRH, into the network of blood vessels which surrounds the pituitary gland. Stimulated by pulses of gonadotrophin-releasing hormone, Cells in the pituitary gland secrete another hormone, follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH. FSH travels in the bloodstream, reaching the ovaries. There it stimulates the formation and growth of an ovarian follicle in one or other ovary. The follicle consists of an egg, a number of surrounding cells which secrete estrogen hormones, and fluid. FSH helps the egg to mature and prepares it for release. As the follicle matures, the hypothalamus increases secretion of GnRH. This in turn stimulates the pituitary to secrete a second hormone which acts on the ovary. This is luteinizing hormone, or LH. Toward the middle of the cycle, there is a sudden peak in the blood level of LH. This acts as the trigger for ovulation. Within minutes of its release, the egg is guided by suction through the fringed opening of the outer end of the fallopian tube, starting it on a journey which will take five or six days as it passes down the tube and finally reaches the cavity of the uterus. Meanwhile, after the follicle ruptures, it is converted into this yellowish body known as the corpus luteum. Cells of the corpus luteum secrete the hormone progesterone, which brings about important changes in the lining of the uterus, preparing it for possible pregnancy. In fact, the lining of the uterus, known as the endometrium, undergoes changes in response to hormone levels during the cycle. In the first half of the cycle, known as the follicular phase, the developing follicle secretes increasing amounts of estrogen hormone which encourages regeneration of the endometrium. After ovulation, there are important changes in the endometrium, aimed at making it suitable to receive a fertilized egg. These changes are brought about by a secretion of progesterone from the corpus luteum. The secretion of progesterone is maintained for several days, but if the egg is not fertilized in that time, the corpus luteum withers, and falling levels of progesterone and estrogen trigger the shedding of the uterine lining as the menstrual flow. The cycle then starts again. But if the egg is fertilized, no menstruation occurs as the corpus luteum continues to function, secreting progesterone during the first three months of the pregnancy. Thereafter, numerous changes occur to support the developing embryo.